Annyeong haseyo. In episode 1 we introduced an abstract syntax tree or AST for representing and storing the parser results for a made-up B-like programming language for this tutorial on making a compiler. Now it is time to say goodbye to these little saplings we have grown to love, because from now on we do things very differently. Say hello to our new atoms! Hello! Our next intermediate representation is going to be made of sequences of these instructions. Some people call this a three address code, but I just prefer calling them statements. Sometimes I will call them instructions. The NOP statement will be a placeholder that does not do anything. The init statement will initialize the target register with a reference to a function or another global symbol, or an integer literal, or the sum of both. The add statement and the neg statement do arithmetic operations. The copy statement copies a value from a variable to another variable. I will usually call these variables as registers in this video, but we are not talking about assembler yet. These are just local variables. The read and write statements read and write memory. The ic statement compares two variables and stores the result. The if and z instruction branches the execution depending on the value in the register. The f call statement calls a function, and the read statement returns from a function. These will be the elements for which this episode and the next one will be founded on. Next comes some template programming. The 4-bit template will be used soon to make sure that overloaded functions with parameter packs cannot contain specified types of elements as parameters. The require iterator t template is also used in template programming to make sure the function signature matches only if the parameter is an iterator type that points to the selected type of elements. Now, the statement element. The statement has a type of course, and it has parameters as discussed earlier. It also has a pointer to the next statement. I ran a couple of polls on Twitter and Discord on how you would like me to write the constructors for this class, and based on your feedback, I eventually settled on this design, where each different type of parameters is handled with a separate constructor, and delegating constructors are used to process all parameters recursively. The init type statement, which has two extra member fields, ident and value, will be processed with a separate constructor that accepts initializers for those fields, and also sets the statement type. The if and z type is processed in that same way. It sets an alternative link to the next statement. Finally, the statement can also be constructed using an iterator pair. This is enforced using the require iterator t type def that I created earlier. The 4-bit t class is used to make sure that the same field can only be initialized once. This is completely optional, but it has basically the same purpose as to why people write static asserts. To catch potentially invalid code at compile time. The dump method is rather straightforward. A switch case selects the statement type, and converts it into a string, and then all parameters are printed. And if the statement is an init statement, the ident and value parameters are printed too. Now we get to the actual compiler body. I mean the part that translates the tree structure into the statement list. First, because we don't want to deal with string types in the statement-based code, we create a global object that concatenates all the string constants used in the program. Later on, the program code can simply refer to this global object. The statements are essentially going to be pointers. To make sure their lifetime is known and determinate, instead of using reference counting shared pointers or anything like that, we just use a single vector that owns all the statements. It is this all statements vector. The type unique PTR signifies that this is the only owner of the statements. Anyone else who possesses a pointer to a statement is just referring to them without owning them. This is how I designed this, but there are many different ways to do it. The statements listed in the all statements vector are all equal in rank. They are just statements, unnamed statements somewhere. To bring meaning to the statements, we must create a table of labels. The entry points vector points to the first statement in each function. There is also the information about how many parameters each function takes. 
Say if the function takes three parameters, then registers number 0, 1 and 2 will contain the initial values of those parameters when the function is entered. The compilation will begin from building the string table. For each function, the number of parameters is saved. A temporary context is created for keeping track of variables and also of the pointer where the next statement should be saved. The compiler function will process the expression tree recursively, creating statements corresponding to each expression and returning the register number where the return value of that expression is stored. These two utility lambdas, make and put, will be used multiple times throughout this function. First, we have simple unary operations like the negation or pointer dereference. The parameter of that expression is compiled first, and the register number that stores the result of that expression is saved as a parameter in the new statement. The number literal expression is converted into an init statement. The same is also done with the string literal expression. A function identifier is also converted into an init statement. However, function parameters and local variables do not generate any new statements at all. Instead, we just return the register number in which that particular variable was stored. The add, ic and comma expressions are interesting in that they may take multiple parameters, any number from 1 to infinity, but the statements we create always have one target parameter and two source parameters. This loop converts the multi-parameter expressions into two-parameter statements using the result of the previous statement as the source of the next statement if necessary. The copy expression which copies the value of a variable into another is one of the few expressions in this language where the evaluation order is explicitly specified. We evaluate the source before the target. Additionally, if the target expression is a pointer dereference, we must create a memory write statement rather than a copy statement. If at this point the code being compiled contains address of expressions, either the optimizer from episode 2 did not do its job properly, or the programmer wants to do something weird with local variables. For now I am not going to support that. Instead I will have the compiler print an error message. The function call is another expression that can contain an arbitrary number of parameters. It is compiled in a rather straightforward manner. Because the C++ standard does not contain a transform iterator, I know Boost has one, but I'm not going to add a dependency. I created my own, which you can see me using here. It simplifies the code a bit. Time for a little recap. In episode 0 we started with this code. In episode 1 we lexed and parsed it, and this tree structure was produced. In episode 2 we optimized the tree, and it was transformed like this. And right now we just wrote code that converts the tree into this code. Each expression in the tree is converted into one statement or nothing. Some of these expressions did not produce any statements, because they convey data sources or structure. And having done that, we no longer need the tree. Or the original code for that matter. But this is not the full truth. In reality we created a linked list. Each statement is a node in a linked list. They have a next pointer that points where the next operation is. The first statement is pointed by a table of global labels. In this example, it is the word append. But remember, we had two pointers in the statement definition. It's true, they are needed to support conditional execution. Remember, this language had three kinds of conditional expressions. The AND expression, the OR expression and the LOOP expression. The AND expression gets compiled like this. Each test produces an if and z statement. Any test that produces zero will be directed into a statement that sets the result zero. If a test produces non-zero, it will be directed into the next test. If the last test produces non-zero, it will be directed into a statement that sets the result one. Finally, all paths converge in a single knob statement from which the function continues, or in this case it ends. The init and knob nodes are extras that did not exist in the original tree. The OR expression follows a similar pattern. In fact, these two solutions have much in common, as you can see. 
in the end, a zero value from a test jumps straight into the end, a non-zero value continues to the next test. In the OR, a zero value from a test continues to the next test, but a non-zero value jumps straight to the end. The while loop has the same elements, two result nodes and one end node. There is now only one comparison node. If the comparison produces non-zero, it will branch into the loop body. The loop body is linked back into the comparison. If the comparison produces zero, it will branch into a statement that sets the result zero, and then that will lead into an end statement. Technically, the init and nop nodes are totally redundant in this while loop, but using the same mechanism for all three branch expressions simplifies my code quite a bit, and the optimizer from episode 4 will make sure the same result is gotten in any case. So we will process the loop and and or expressions. Every one of them will be run through this same process. They all will have the then node and an else node and an end node, which is a knob. The most difficult part of this is in keeping track where to place the code. The target pointer, in the context, is a pointer to a pointer. It points to the location where the compiler should put the next statement, and this statement itself is a pointer, so the context has a pointer to a pointer. Here the begin is a reference to a pointer. A reference and a pointer are basically the same thing, except a pointer can change, while a reference cannot. A reference can also never be null. In many ways, therefore, references are safer than pointers. This is just one of the tools C++ provides to make safer code than languages that came before it. In the main program we just print the compiled code for now. The code is printed using this dump function. We begin printing from the entry points of each function and see where it leads us when we just follow the next pointer for each statement. But we must also follow the cont pointers for even these statements. We need some kind of bookkeeping of which statements we have already printed. In case multiple statements lead into the same target, we also need labels. Labels are also used for the function entries. These labels are printed as jump instructions that are not real statements. Let's try the compiler with a sample function. This is the find function from episode 0. And this is the IR code generated from that tree. You may notice it is pretty wordy. In fact, if we generate IR code from the unoptimized tree, as if we went straight from episode 1 to episode 3, the IR code looks almost identical. This is because the source code was already pretty tight and had no room for the kind of optimizations detailed in episode 2. This is not to say that it could not be optimized. In the next episode, next two episodes probably, we will deal with algorithms to optimize the IR code. On the right you can see an example of what might be produced as a result of these algorithms. Here is another function. Again, the IR code generated from the optimized and unoptimized trees are almost identical, but careful optimization will take this down to almost half. This is what we will do in the next episode. Redundant store elimination, tail call optimization, jump threading, and that sort of things. There is a lot to do, so much in fact, that I will probably split it into two or even three episodes, after which we will start generating actual machine code for some real hardware and see how it runs. As always, please leave lots of comments and ask any questions you have in your mind. I read them all. Whether the video is new or old, I read all of your comments, and usually I reply to, and do thumbs up or thumbs down to show what you think of this video series. I hope to see you again. Chun harubonesejo.